So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today on our Sustainability in Tech Lunch webinar. So um, if you don't know who, my who I am, my name's Ellie Greeny and I'm one of the directors at Transition Partners. We specialise in IT, business change, transformation and digital recruitment. Um, home for us is Leeds, our head office is in Leeds, so Yorkshire is really home for us, but we recruit all across Europe as well. Um, I've been running tech events for over five years now and we've covered a whole host of different topics from artificial intelligence to menopause in the workplace, IR35 and neurodiversity, so so many different topics, but one that we've never touched on before and I'm extremely excited today is sustainability. So um, if you are interested, if you've not attended our events before, we keep an up-to-date um, tech event schedule on our Transition Partners LinkedIn um, profile, so please do give us a follow on LinkedIn to stay informed. Um, Regarding sustainability, I am by no means an expert at all, really. I'm just at the very start of my journey on this topic. Um, so I thought it'd be fantastic to be able to ar arrange a lunchtime webinar with um, a really strong panel so we can all learn a thing or two and take away some positive actions following today. Um, some of you may know, some of you may not, that today is actually meant to be Earth Overshoot Day. So Earth Overshoot Day actually marks the date when humanity has exhausted nature's budget for the year. But due to the positive impact that lockdowns had on our environment, it's actually been pushed back a month till August the 22nd, which is great news. Um, so we thought we'd still carry on with the event today um, and keep it locked in for today's diary. So really um, happy to have everyone attend. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce our fantastic panel. Luckily, Alexis has just joined us back. So great news. Um, so we've got an expert panel um, of individuals from all across Yorkshire to talk about their background, their interest in sustainability, their passion for making positive impact. And um, so without further ado, I'll do a few introductions. So we have Rich Kenny. Hi, Rich. Hey, everybody. Ah. Uh, my name's Rich Kenny. I'm the Group IT Director at Techfire. So my remit's looking after IT, digital and sustainability initiatives uh, in the UK. We, um, we kind of punch above our weight when it comes to sustainability. We're a smallish company, we turn over about 45 million a year, but we've just recently given evidence for the Environmental Audit Committee for Parliament in regards to uh, refurbishment and reuse of equipment. Um, and we quite often are kind of consulted for special interest groups on sustainability and environmental impact of ICT hardware. So that's what we do. Fantastic. So Rich was um, the first one to kind of like introduce me into this topic and have a bit of a discussion. We, we chatted a couple of months ago now, didn't we, Rich? Um, and so it would be fantastic to bring his expertise to the panel today and uh, hopefully give you some more insight. This is a kind of lower level introduction into sustainability in hopes that we can kind of shape a community and an ongoing um, event schedule around the topic. So today yep. we... If anyone wants any further information, feel free to contact the panel as well. So Rich then introduced me into Alexis Percival. So hi, Alexis. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm Alexis Percival. I'm the Environmental and Sustainability Manager with Yorkshire Ambulance Service. Uh, and I've been in post for 10 years battling the, uh, the carbon reduction uh, task for blue light services, which is a fair challenge. Um, we, we've got a... That I have to say COVID has pushed forward a lot of our um, uh, ICT agenda so it's it's helped in a lot of ways um, but it's also kind of helped us uh, drive sustainability in a different direction as well. Fantastic we're really happy to have you here today so thank you so much Alexis and then in the sunshine we've got Ben. Hi Ben. Hi everybody my name is <laughs> Ben Tung I'm a sustainability professional i um, been doing it for quite a while now. I used to work in sort of um, estates and campus management in HE, um, looking at green buildings and edible campuses and waste and that kind of stuff. But I've moved for the last couple, two and a half years, I've been working in sustainable tech in the health service. I'm trained in circular economy, um, trying to drive some conversations around climate breakdown resilience and what, what tech has got to contribute to that area, because I think it's going to be a big player. And I'm currently working with... NHS England on the cross system um, digital digital work stream for getting to net zero. So that's some really interesting cutting edge stuff. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. And then someone that I connected with on LinkedIn is the lovely Will Saunders. Hi, Will. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's uh, really 
really good to be here and see uh, 36 people on this. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so my name is Will Saunders, I'm the founder of uh, Goodwill Studios, which is an ethical design agency here in Leeds. So I've been in the design digital world for about 15 years now, mostly doing uh, graphic design, branding, digital and print. And for the past few years, I've been on a bit of a kind of personal journey, trying to become as sustainable as possible, reducing my impact. Um, and that's led into me wanting to like, put those values into my business. So recently, um, rebranded, re repositioned my business to align with those values and work um, primarily with social enterprises, ethical businesses and environmental environmental organizations to, you know, make a bigger impact. And I'm also involved in starting conversations within my digital design uh, world to try and help them become uh, more environmentally sustainable themselves and use the skills for good. So that's me in a nutshell. Great, amazing. And then we've got the ever enthusiastic Anna Bateman as well. Hi, Anna. <laughs> hey guys, really good to be on the uh, panel today for the Sustainability in Tech webinar. Uh, my name's Anna Bateman. Uh, I work for a company called ISDM Solutions. I sit as their global supply chain manager. And I also sit on their sustainability and environmental panel as well. So we are pushing for improvements, not only in our company as well, but actually for our clients so that we can achieve sustainability improvements for our client teams and their agendas too. I have previous to my role at ISDM spent 10 years installing renewable energy technologies up and down the UK. So that's solar photovoltaic systems and a whole different array of hydro, air source heat pumps, um, etc. Other work that I've done has been on the uh, flood uh, incentive schemes across Calderdale, working with Calderdale Council to help sort of climate mitigation and resilience in the community as well. Wow, so I'm sure everyone will agree. We've got a fantastic panel here today spending their time, so, so thank you so much for your time. Um, this is an interactive session, so we're going to go through a few questions um, that we as, um, thought, as hosts today that thought they might be of interest to you and hope we can all learn a little bit. But there is actually at the bottom of the Zoom, there is a, an access to a Q&A section, a live chat, so feel free to pop any questions that you've got for us in the Q&A or the chat and we'll come back to them as we go through today and try and answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, so let's start with you then Rich. So what does sustainability mean to you? And also if you can give us a bit of an intro into what the profits, planning and people aspect. Yeah so sustainability is a natural term for me, it's all about balance. So you know, we've just talked about there about the three P's, um, triple bottom line. So that's people, profit, planet. So this is the concept that the best sustainable outcome is to get a tie up of all three. So your best outcome for your people, the best outcome for the planet and the best outcome for the profits of the business. Because without any one of those three working, um, the company is not efficient or effective and it's certainly not sustainable. So that's very much what we're talking about is finding that balance. It's becoming quite a big conversation now because quite often companies have gone after the, the lower P, which is profit. Uh, and what they've seen is that's led to negative outcomes, both for the well-being and health of their people and also um, what they've kind of done to the planet. So uh, there's an example I always use to kind of show how this works in practice. And the example I always use is Nike in the 1990s. So in the, uh, most of you probably don't remember this, but like in the 90s, Nike was one of the most poorly regarded companies on the planet in regards to its labor laws. Uh, they basically had, um, you know, sweatshops all over China and Asia producing products. And the reason behind that was because they were financially incentivized to look for the lowest possible price on their procurement. But their sales team were negatively incentivated by like terrible sales. So by focusing on only one stream, which was the profit side of things, they, they led to massive decline in sales, huge problems from government. They were, they were being significantly punished. But if you look at Nike now, they're kind of seen as the company to work for, to be associated with, like they have the best athletes because they, they've embraced the fact that they need to look after the people. They do so many sustainable initiatives. And on the back of that, they've made as much money as possible. That's what sustainability means in business. It's finding that sweet spot where those three intersect and doing the best for all of them. Um, there's always going to be a trade-off, but the key is that the trade-off is related to the three combined. So, you know, pursuing one at the exclusive of all the others is a, is a less than beneficial outcome. So this isn't about 
just pushing to say uh, pushing environmental just pushing people this is about hitting that that perfect collaborative position and that sweet spot on the triple p so that that for me is what sustainability is about for a business is finding that sweet spot personally it's about creating a better world for for like my son and 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 my family um mm. do you know what i mean i i don't want my son to get the short end of the stick when it comes to what's left for him whether that's resource whether that's environment whether that's health so for me it's about finding initiatives that mean that he's going to have the best possible life he can have um so that's the kind of two sides of it from a personal point of view and from a from a business point of view love that perfect it's making a lot of sense there so ben this one's for you what's um the hidden impact of digital i think that's a great question so i i having worked in sustainability for 20 or so years and then starting off working in sustainable tech I, it's not something that I'd considered and I think it's a really niche area of sustainability as well. So it's only in the last year or so that really people have started to realise on mass that having a high data footprint has a significant environmental impact. So I'll chuck a few little stats at you, but um, mm -hmm. digital digital has ICT globally has it would be the third biggest country in the world in terms of carbon footprint if it was a country. Um, wow. By some by some analysis, going to the cinema has a lower carbon footprint than streaming a movie at home. It, obviously, it depends a bit on how you travel, etc. But using average figures, so streaming an HD movie at home is really has a really big footprint. There's a great BBC documentary called Dirty Streaming that you can check out if you were so inclined. It um, that looks at the the hidden impact, really, essentially, of all the big data centres. Um, buying stuff as well that is has a big impact so for normal user devices say phones laptops tablets that kind of thing 80 percent of the energy is embodied in the manufacturing process from a life cycle perspective so how can you how can you make your devices last longer how can you get more like more use more lives out of them that kind of thing it's really important but it's not just energy there's all kinds of other impacts as well so there's a horrible lake in inner mongolia that's called the most polluted place in the world where they do all the rare earth metal mining so um, there's all those kind of issues and slave labor as well that there's quite notorious isn't it the ict supply chain um mm. for that kind of thing so we've got to look across the the triple bottom line of sustainability to to get all of the key elements in there um quite a, a quite a good example i'll finish with i guess is um the bitcoin uh, revolution that started i don't know if anyone saw that but there was a few articles that came out about how the bitcoin system has the same energy footprint as i think it was ireland or denmark depending on which um which articles you were reading but oh, essentially wow. this system which is basically used for speculating um around the value of bitcoin rather than actually buying stuff um mm -hmm. due to the way that it's set up demands huge brute force systems to crack all the um the way that the way that it works and the energy is absolutely amazing and that's like the classic example of what happens in a digital service if sustainability isn't designed in at the beginning i'll stop there yeah no i think that's fantastic to be able to give a bit insight across the both pieces the digital the hardware actually whilst we're on that point i'm going to throw it back to rich because this is his area of expertise so rich can you expand on that at all yeah, on the hardware side of things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you like you taught me a lot about that. Though. Yeah, Ben Ben made a really good point there about streaming, and that's to do with the data side of stuff. And I'll come on to that later on. We've got a question later on on energy efficiency. So, so I will revisit that. In regards to bodied energy, um, like Ben was saying, eighty percent of the sort of the embodied energy is also non recoverable. So not just of the amount that's there, but the amount that you're going, you can't actually get that back. Recycling is not an effective mechanism. A lot of these mm -hmm. trace materials and, and sort of critical raw materials can't be adequately recycled. So your average server, for example, you know, weighs like 20 kilos. It might get used for three years, but it's probably got a usable extended life of maybe eight to 10 years. But if you recycle after three, it then it, if you don't refurbish it and get it back into circulation, it becomes e-waste fundamentally. And the ability to recycle, I think, there's, I think there's 12 out of the 27 critical raw materials that appear in a server. So that's wow. like, you know, that's like not just like fresh materials like gold and silver, this is like tungsten. Um, this is like nickel, aluminium, um, you know, all this sort of stuff, the coatings, you just can't recover even by a techniques like bio leaching. So mm. people think they do the right thing by recycling ICT equipment, but it has to be extended, it has to be use based because you just can't get it back. Um, but you know, like they, they were saying in like creating a laptop, it requires 
sort of like 100, 190,000 litres of water to manufacture wow. and mine those materials. It's, it's 1.2 tonnes of earth to build a laptop because that's how much it requires to excavate the materials that that's used. So this mining of critical raw materials in ICT equipment is significant to say the least. Um, you're talking massive amounts. And if you only use it for three years rather than six years, then you're fundamentally wasting a second use of that of that equipment so you know 1.2 tons of earth and all that water carbon wise i think there's 300 kilos of embodied carbon in a laptop you know this is a massive amount of, of of raw materials and a massive amount of environmental impact on just a single single device so if we're not extending the life of those we've got a, a serious problem and i hope that i mean i feel like it's become this new thing that we're all kind of starting to wake up to the you don't need a new phone every two years anymore that we had way back in like the, the uh, late 90s where everyone just wanted a new phone all the time and it is changing but it's certainly something that we need to be conscious of um brilliant so thank you so much for that i would love to hear from alexis then about what yorkshire's already doing to help so um here at yorkshire Ambulance service things have as i was mentioning earlier it's, it's kind of progressed for forwards dramatically we've probably jumped about seven years um in technology um, and the rollout of stuff within the NHS. Historically, the NHS is quite lags a long way behind on, on um, IT. Um, we've installed quite a lot of things for uh, energy management systems that monitor stuff. We're looking at free cooling within server rooms to look at how we can minimise the amount of energy waste because it's not just about the IT equipment, it's about what surrounds it as well. But in the past uh, four months, We've essentially thrown everybody out of all of our offices and um, more than likely we're not going back for between 18 months and two years um, with a limited capacity in the office of about 30%. So we've actually had to revolutionise the way we, we work. So um, our call centres have essentially, um, we, we've thrown everybody out and we've given them phones, we've given them laptops uh, and in many cases we're, we're answering 999 calls from home uh, and people who are um shielding can actually function and work at home even if they're doing core work like 999 and 111 services um we've also provided support for um i'm just looking at stats here we've got 220 desks uh, that we've accommodated for social distancing so we've had to provide the infrastructure to support that um and we've had to kind of squeeze in more people into confined spaces put in plastic barriers um but we're also looking at, so we were supposed to roll out teams at the beginning of uh, next year and we've had to expedite that one. And so that's, that's come through uh, a lot faster. So we've, we've done a lot of ticking along in the background up until COVID kicked in. And now everybody, and I'm sure everybody sitting at home on, on a Zoom call, who would have thought that we would be doing a conference by Zoom calls rather than dragging everybody into the centre of Leeds or, or York or Harrogate. Um, it, it's it's revolutionized the way we function as a as an ambulance service but also as a county and a country um, and there's a lot of benefits from this but there will be hidden costs as ben's mentioning about streaming and the the impact of that stuff behind the scenes um, so we need to make sure that whatever is in the the back office stuff the server rooms the cloud services the um the data centers we make sure that we're not storing stuff for too long an email accounts for seven grams of carbon dioxide and imagine you've got an email that says do you want a cup of tea and it sits on your server for the next 20 years which i'm sure if we all kind of trawl through our emails we've got hundreds of them that say let's go to the kitchen for a natter um those will sit there seven grams of carbon just accumulating so essentially doing a data cleanse you can actually reduce your carbon footprints by a car's worth of, of energy in a year so there's a lot of things that we need to kind of improve within the data um, storage but also tech services that we need to look at as well fantastic now will you're pretty involved in the tech community in yorkshire i know that you um, ran an event as part of leeds digital festival but i think it's really important that and i'm sure most people that have joined with us today that want to we want to take a step forward um, in the right direction. So it'd be interesting to hear from you how you think that we can become a more responsible digital community and what we can do about it. Mm. Yeah, um, I am also 
on a sort of journey too. So, you know, uh, it, it is a, a fantastic learning experience just to talk to people and to, you know, be a guest in this mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I've been in the industry for about 15 years now in agencies, been self-employed, um, running small agency too. So I kind of, you know, I do understand the the culture where we're all, it's a very fast paced, you know, in, in industry, I'm sure it's the same with a lot of uh, jobs mm -hmm. where we're all focused on, you know, the projects, meeting, meeting our targets, um, you know, very much interested in the in the technology if it's software as well and and making the best project that we can and there often isn't much thought outside of us doing that daily job and we don't often think about what the impact is of sending an, an email to like five people saying you know fancy a pint after work <laughs> so like you said you know um alexis that can build up massively um especially in, in my industry when we send quite big like graphic files and zip mm -hmm. files um, when we might not have to do, send it all, that kind of thing. So there's a, there's a lot of things we can do internally within like the confines of the agency, whether that's a physical office now or various people's living rooms and kitchen tables. Um, some of those things m might be as relatively simple as like switching your energy, you know, provider to a, um, a, a a more a more kind of sustainable or renewable rather option um there's options to shift to a, a four day working week which will reduce the amount of usage that we get out of our you know workstations and such obviously there's um what we eat on our our lunches moving towards a more plant based kind of diet and yeah, like the whole kind of remote working thing that we are going through at the moment, uh, that's got pros and cons, but I think overall, um, I might be wrong, but there's the opportunity to have a lot more pros and cons with that. So um, if we can, you know, leave lockdown with all, all that learning, that'd be really good. But um, the, the main kind of impact I think that, that we can have, especially from the digital agency side, is not just changing how we live and work within our own businesses, but like using our skills to kind of, you know, put out that, um, that kind of sustainability. Um, kind of, yeah, no, I think know? it's good. I think you've given lots of positive points there. Mm -hmm. um, that will certainly help and, and ideas I think that, that people can think about implementing which is really great um, Anna well, it'd be interesting to discuss kind of local ideas and schemes there are for carbon offsetting and also if you can tell us about like the benefits I know we've mentioned it a few times Will has, Alexis has around the benefits of the carbon offsetting that we've had since lockdown Absolutely. Um, there's loads of initiatives going on locally in the north of the UK. Now, I have focused my attention on the north of the UK with me being based up here, but there's going to be loads of local initiatives in the UK and then in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. We have the Northern Forest Initiative in the UK, and this is from the Woodland Trust. Now, this initiative is to plant 50 million trees in the next I think it's about six years. I can't be held to that um, exact six year figure. Now that spans all the main cities across the north of England, so the north of the UK there. So there'll be local councils and local community volunteer groups that are, uh, are feeding into this 50 million tree planting. In Calderdale itself, in Hebden Bridge, we've got Tree Responsibility, who've been around for almost probably five to 10 years. They've just trained up a new set of uh, community group as well called Forest Tree. Uh, and these guys plant trees, um, they, they work with enterprises, ISDM have been in negotiations with them as well, so we can actually get bodies and teams from our company to go and plant trees. So if we go and do these tree planting days, it does take 50 years, for you to get these benefits from the tree planting. So for businesses, if you're looking to offset your carbon, that's something you want to be looking at doing now and supporting these initiatives that are going on now, whether that's via funding or whether that's actually supplying bodies to go and plant trees as well. 
Other really good areas are, um, it's not just in the tree planting, you've got Moors for the Future as well, which are an initiative and they're looking after the bogs and the spag, spag, sorry, sphagnum moss on the moors as well. And that captures carbon as well and just keeps those natural habitats and ecosystems then as well up on the moorland. Another great one is hedge planting. I am yet to have the carbon figures on the hedge planting. I know that with trees, it's 350 tonnes per hectare planters. Um, but that then is again over that 50 year period as well. Uh, another initiative for companies is, you know, you can support sustainable housing developments. There's community initiatives on sustainable, affordable housing that go on. I know that Calderdale have the Calder Valley Community Land Trust, which is an initiative to support affordable, sustainable housing. So all these initiatives are looking for funding as well. So there's really lots out there for companies to, to help manage their carbon and offset that carbon as well. Brilliant. Loads of positive ideas and initiatives that we can get involved in there and businesses to have a think about, which is brilliant. And um, Rich, this one's back to you. What's the environmental and energy cost of data use? Yes, yeah, so this is massive. And I think this is a question people tend to want an answer on because it's interesting. Mm. So um, <laughs> data center is responsible for about 5% of the world's energy usage and about 5% of the emissions. That's mm. as it is currently, but that's due to grow to sort of 6 to 8% by 2024. So at the time when other industries decreasing their carbon impact and their, their impact on um, sort of energy usage, the data centers is increasing and the, the drive behind that is consumer consumption of data. So I use this stat all the time quite a lot. So UK houses use about 3,700 kilowatts of energy a year. A US house uses 11,000. So your average US house consumes three times as much energy as the average UK household. That's just, that's just how it is culturally. Now, that's made up of lots of microtransactions, so that's made up of heating, electric, all the rest of it. Um, but as Ben talked about, streaming is a massive impact on data usage, and it's actually the quality that's more of a concern than the volume of it. So your average HD movie requires about one kilowatt an hour of energy consumption. A 4K movie requires about three kilowatts. So choosing to watch a movie in slightly higher definition is three times worse from an energy point of view for the same amount of data. Now, if you go back, before HD to standard definition, that's about three times smaller again. So if you stream an episode of The Wire, for example, in, in standard definition, which was filmed in standard definition, you're looking at about 0.3 kilowatts an hour. To watch that exact same thing in 4K is 10 times worse for the environment. So that's a consumption choice you're making based on your willingness to consume slightly higher quality video. You have a 10 times larger impact on the environment. Now that's, that's quite vast. And if you think that if you combine that with net faster network speeds, such as you know, 5G, IoT and sensor data, you're talking about millions of those transactions being available, which weren't traditionally available. So when COVID had only source, but the London Internet Exchange actually increased its um, output by 20% over one day. So the second we went from home working, from uh, working in office to home, it jumped by 20% and has stayed at that level. Now, my concern is that we come back out of lockdown and have adopted bad data habits. So rather than sending a text to your mum or your dad saying, hey, everything's all right, you have a 30 minute Zoom call using video rather than that one text. Or rather than just telling your mate on the phone, you're now going to have a 20 person group chat that goes on for an hour. Now, these are habits that were necessary in lockdown, but perhaps aren't necessary now. So we need to make sure that those impacts aren't then going forward. So there's one stat I use all the time to kind of Im illustrate data's impact on a way that you just don't think about it. And it's a social media stat that I use all the time through Instagram. So social media consumes vast quantities of data, like you wouldn't believe. But and Ronaldo has, Yeah, like <laughs> most people scrolling feeds, right? So Ronaldo has 188 million viewers, okay, on his Instagram. When he posts a picture, single picture, that uses 24 megawatt hours of data. So that's in that one picture consumption, that's enough to power six and a half UK households for the year. And that's one wow. celebrity posting one photo once. Now, these are, this, this is a massive transaction for you to view and that, look at that photo. It's the same as when you go for a meal out and some, someone takes a picture of their cheesecake and posts it on Facebook and 100 people have to consume that, that you know, hashtag love my cheesecake photo. Like that transaction seems like a kind of normal thing. It's sickening because it shouldn't be normal. It's, a, it's an act of pointlessness in my mind. But you're actually forcing that consumption. That data then has to be saved for a set amount of time. And Alexis said this earlier on around like saving your seven grams of carbon for your email. You have to then store that data on your phone. 
you then back it up to the cloud, they then have some kind of replication and backup over there. So your cheesecake has now been saved three times just by you. Everyone that's consumed that has had to view it, download it and capture it as well. So every one of these small data transactions has a quite sizable cost. And I think the problem is because people can't physically see data, they presume that it doesn't have that carbon impact. So you look at an invoice on a piece of paper and you go, that's a piece of paper, I better not waste that, right? I better not print, like, print 5,000 invoices. Mm -hmm. We'd happily send that 100 kilobyte file to everyone in accounts. And then when they query it, they send it back to everyone in accounts. And then when they send it back to the supplier, they send it to their account group. And what you have is that 100 kilobyte file has now been shared or printed 400 times, 500 times based on the distribution groups. And each one of those is then backed up for a set amount of time. And this is what we're talking about is these small micro transactions of data have huge consumption mm -hmm. effects. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the big thing. And if we don't get a curtailment on that consumption of data, we're in for a real tricky ride, to be honest, because all the benefits we're getting from remote working and lockdown are going to quickly be eroded um, by poor decision making because people just aren't aware. This is not selfishness. This is not badness. This is a lack of education, a lack of information. That's all this is. And that's yeah. why it's important to have meetings like this and have chats like this to help people understand what impact they're having unintentionally. Yeah, of course. Um, that's brilliant. Ben, quick one for you. What ideas have you got to help make Leeds a smart city? Okay, I think this is kind of like the million dollar question, really, because it's, of course, digital no is exploding. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to give you the perfect answer, I'll tell you now. <laughs> it, digital is exploding, isn't it, as a thing? It has been for a decade or so, and it's going to get ramping up in terms of pace and proliferation. Um, how do we get everything interoperable is the technical term. How do you make, make all the systems talk to each other? So smart cities have been around for a while. I think they're still in their infancy, though, to be honest. Um, Leeds is starting to think about it. I've got a bit more direct experience with smart hospitals working in the health sector. So, um, you know, there, and there's some really interesting co-benefits that you consider. And I think this is where it starts to get really interesting. So if you think about what, what phones can do now, if you walk into a hospital, um, your phone can automatically talk to the Wi-Fi networks there and get sent information directing you around the place, telling, telling different parts of the hospital treatment services that you're there and essentially automating the experience to make huge efficiency savings and huge experience improvements. Um, phones as well start to open up lots of interesting possibilities around remote treatment so telehealth has exploded during covid obviously and the, the long-term plan has gone through massively massive acceleration but you know there's also a range of um apps available through the nhs apps library um that allow people to all kinds of treatment options from home thus removing the need to travel and it i think this all links into a fully interoperable smart solution just a couple of extra points i'd throw in is we've got some great thinkers in leeds on this i'm sure many of you know about the leeds odi already um but you know that that open data is clearly super important when it comes to interoperable smart anything um and my last point i i introduced in my introduction really but around climate breakdown resilience i think smart approaches are going to be needed to have preparation for early warning systems and emergency responses um, and give us the adaptability that we're going to need in the future so it's crucial there's loads of people thinking about this already though you know when in my day job at nhsd um whole teams of people are, are looking at interoperability so um you know it's not a sustainability issue per se but it's obviously crucial for efficiency savings i'll stop again yeah brilliant i think you gave some um Great examples there as well. What well, um before we kind of go into the um attendees questions, because I know there's been a few questions come through, but guys, please please do keep sending them and we'll try and work through them as well. And um, Will, it'll be great to um end the, the, this question section around your top um three top tips for social responsibility. Right. Uh three top tips. <laughs> um well it really has to start with us us learning as much as we can, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and these people on this this session, they can really help with that. Um, so I suppose it starts, or, 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 or aside with me, about kind of asking questions about the, the kind of current system and how things are made and produced. 
and why we do what we do. Um, the risk of us getting into a bit of an existential crisis, but that can be quite healthy, uh, especially when we're, we're, we're witnessing, you know, some very negative uh, impacts of the, the current system. So things do need to change, but it might be worth focusing on just one area, one, uh, you know, issue that, that kind of interests you the most rather than trying to, you know, um, fix the world in one go. So mm -hmm. that kind of leads me on to like step two is about starting where you are. So, you know, we can't change the world overnight. We, we can't make massive change individually, but we've got to use the resources that we have. So, you know, the, the, the platforms, you know, the people in the organization that I work with and the teams that we, we have and to try and, you know, align uh, those values that we have with the, the goals that we have as a digital business, you know, and, 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 and talking about the platforms. Um, and it was, it, it was very shocking to, to hear Rich's um, cheesecake photo example, but potentially, <laughs> Um, if, if, if we, if we did have a great, you know, platform and a great social media following, maybe using that platform to, to kind of spread a positive message might mm -hmm. outweigh some of those negative, you know, impacts. So that's, that's what I mean when I say use the skills and the resources that we have, um, you know, to kind of get this message out there. And yeah, I love that actually. And that's maybe something that we can do as a business as well. Like we've got, I think maybe like 10,000 followers or something on our TP LinkedIn page. Exactly. And as a business, my team have got over a hundred thousand followers on LinkedIn, but there's stuff that like, sometimes we post like positive, we try and post as much positive content as we can, but maybe if we could put facts around sustainability within tech and in like small improvements that people could do, I think that would be a really positive thing. So, um, yeah, hopefully my social media and events manager Alicia is on the on the webinar today and I'm sure that's something that we can work on together to help post ideas because it's like it's some I think there's been a couple of comments in the chat that sometimes you just don't realize and you don't know it's not it's around educating isn't it people so if we can put out positive ideas and um, they can help people make small changes like deleting their emails or like turning off their images you know like when someone sends you a whatsapp message and before you know it you've got 50 dresses from your best friend saved on there it sounds to me all the time like i could just literally switch that off and make a positive impact um so yeah there's definitely some really positive ideas and um yeah thank you so much for that right now here's the hard bit guys this is the questions from the audience. So the first question from Rose, as a small business, what would you say would be a good first step to becoming more sustainable? Great question. Who's up for answering that? Don't all put your hands up at once. <laughs> is, that you, is that your hand up then? Oh, Will's gonna answer it. Okay, Will. <laughs> okay, well, um, of Obviously, this this sort of depends on the business that you you have. Mm. But uh, because my background is in sort of branding and you know um, brand positioning and such, I think everything starts off with with like your your values as a brand and and how you then want to be seen in the world. So it might be worth kind of you know re re reviewing your own internal like brand values, what's important to you. And then that, you know, get a little document, internal document written down with your team. So it kind of gives you a bit of a, you know, a, a map or a, a kind of navigation point to help you to be like, okay, so, you know, we don't do this. We, our goals are this, and you can perhaps bake in sustainability goals alongside your financial goals, you know? So pull that in, into the into the board level um decision making and then everything else can can sort of stem from there yeah i think that ties in quite nicely with what um rich was saying earlier about the three p's as well about bringing that in and being able to achieve your business goals at the same time which is obviously important for all of us but being able to think about the bigger picture as well ben did you have something to add to that 
I suppose, I mean, it's quite simple to have a think about your carbon's quite an easy way into it. It's quite measurable, isn't it? And it's it's the issue of the moment. So um, mm. there's various carbon calculators available online. So it's quite easy to do a kind of materiality assessment to look at where your big impact areas are and then have a think about what you could practically do to start to reduce those. That's, that's probably been my first port of call. Yeah, that's a great tip. So Tyler has messaged in, do you think the impact of COVID will improve the perspective of sustainability or be seen as a cost too high in the economic instability of reality we're entering? Who's up for this one? Anna. On that question, I would like to sort of first of all say, although we've got these hidden costs in, in data and there are those hidden costs that we do need educating on within data so that we can manage that sustainability sustainably within our organisations, already uh, through this situation, the limitation on the aviation industry and the travel that we are, are not doing even in our cars, never mind just on the, the aeroplanes, will have completely put down uh, carbon emissions. Um, from back in 2016, one of our clients, um, which is a, a global pharma company, Fortune 500 company, they did, uh, they managed to cut their travel budget by 25%, saving 3,785 tonnes of carbon just in the first quarter. And that's only limiting sort of a quarter of their travel. So if you actually wow. look at this COVID situation we're in now, then you're sort of maybe looking at more 90% of these large organisations travel being cut as well. So there's definitely going to be some sustainability value, um, you know, with, with the fact that we have gone more video conferencing and more virtual. But again, it really does, um, from what Richard was saying earlier, we're going to have to manage this because if we're not clever at managing it, then it's not going to do any cost savings at all. So it's raising that awareness within the industry. Yeah, perfect. Anyone else got anything they want to add to that? Yeah, go on, yeah, Rich. It's, it's worth noting, and I, I agree with Anna, like you've got to focus on the positives here, um, but there has to be that behavioural change. And you, you have to also remember that there's an awful lot of legislation coming in around environmental management that mm. is unavoidable for most firms. So you are, as of 2021, going to have to start providing statements around your carbon usage and how you're decreasing that. We've got eco-design directives that are in the EU that we're trying to mirror into the UK in regards to firmware management for firms. It'll have to involve a long-term support for, for products so that can lead to extended product life cycles. There's an awful lot of legislation in the EU and in the UK that the UK will have to mirror soon as well. We'll have to come up with our own alternatives um, mm. that isn't going to allow this to fall off company agendas. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to report accurately. It doesn't mean they're going to report correctly throughout business, but it means they will be made accountable. And that accountability, I think, will mean that this stays on the agenda for a long time. Yeah, definitely. And I think that level of accountability means people are going to have to educate themselves. So we're going to consciously move towards a really positive action off the back of that. So the sooner, the better, I say. <laughs> so Kane sent us a few questions. Hi, Kane. <laughs> I know, Kane. Any examples of good, small proof of concepts for initiating small change within a larger organisation, e.g. changing energy supplier? So any little tips that can make a big impact that we can do um, within a larger organisation? Yeah, Alexis, hi. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, sorry, too many uh, things open on my screen. Um, yeah, I mean, it's for a large organisation, it takes a while to kind of galvanise. August, sorry, my daughter's decided to walk in and, and kind of do right. everything. You um, can join in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, it's one of the joys of working from home. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's taken a long time for the galvanisation of larger organisations to get involved in in this, um, but it's it's something that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, how lovely! <laughs> um, no, we don't need that. Come on. Um, so it, it's it, I think a lot of legislative changes are coming in, especially for the NHS. We've we've have a um, a plan in place that by twenty twenty one, every part of the NHS has to have. Uh, a, a zero emission energy contract in place. Um, so for large organisations, it takes a long time. For smaller organisations, you can do it overnight. Mm. Um, and it's, it, that's a really simple, very quick win. Um, and then uh, if you're kind of embedded with, with tech, it's, it's quite a critical and essential part that you need to think about how you can be um, 
how you can be uh, off grid as such. So how can you start to embed a lot of your sustainability and your solar panels, various things that mean that you can, you're not going to have to deal with brownouts, which will be coming through um, various climate change issues that we've got to look at as well. Perfect, thank you. So we've, we'll probably try and give it another sort of five, 10 minutes to get this one wrapped up. So Kane sent through a few questions. So I'll just ask one for now and then we can always go back if we get time. So cloud versus tin, is there a net environmental benefit moving to cloud considering it's, it's, it's hardware either way? Rich, surely this is one for you. Uh, I think Ben, do you want to go in on this one first, mate, and I'll follow up. So, yeah, okay. Um, so just quickly, that it's not always a clear decision. It's definitely not a good idea to run your own data centre in-house unless you've got lots of experience in it and have a very efficient facility and carbon-free electricity. Um, there are some very efficient co-location providers where you're essentially renting a bit of space from someone if you've got a large operation. But if you've only got a small footprint, I think cloud would be the easiest option. Um, and it's also good for spiky demand. So if you've got a system where it's um, got lot, lots of flow at some points and not much at others, cloud's the obvious choice too. There's the short okay. answer. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm with Ben on this one. It's all about appropriateness. So if, you, if you're talking about a single server, it might be more sensible to use an OPEX model through cloud. But what you have to consider is that when you move to cloud, you're relying on them doing the best thing with their hardware. So if they're on an 18 month refurbishment cycle through their hardware, then they're fundamentally creating massive amounts of e-waste and waste products. And the embodied use in the actual creation of the tins a problem. Whereas if you manage your own estate on premise, you can control the length and optimization of that hardware. Now, energy consumption in the data center is 65% hardware. Now there's cooling and other efficiencies that need to be taken into account. And that's where most of the research is. But fundamentally, the the hardware is nearly always the problem from an energy efficiency point of view. So, so 65% of the world's performance is generated when it's high performance computing, mm. but there's sort of 35% of the, of, the, of the usage of performance is generated by a massive amount of like redundant and useless kit, kit that should be replaced. You don't have any ability to impact that if you're entirely cloud-based. So for me, it's about appropriateness. If you're small or you want a hybrid solution, that's fine. But yeah. bear in mind, when you're talking about cloud, you are fundamentally talking about other people's PCs and other mm. people's servers in their data centers, which you have no control over. So if you want to have a level of control over your sort of environmental impact, you have to make that decision on whether or not you want to control that with your own hardware. And there's yeah. very yeah. much a place for that for a lot of companies. Perfect. I think that was good. And it just gives a lot of insight. So thanks so much for that. So Leslie mentioned the size of definition HD to 4K makes a difference on energy consumption. However, the power consumptions of TVs is largely seen as decreasing due for eco reasons compared to old CRT screens. This is a secure, surely a lot less than improvements today in technology around LED TVs. Surely reduces energy consumption. Have you any references or case studies to back up your claims on this? Oh, controversial. <laughs> it's interesting. We're talking about two different types of energy consumption here, aren't we? Because we're talking about the energy consumption to generate the data for the streaming. And we're talking about the energy consumption of the device. Right. Okay. So let's not let's not get that mixed up. Like that I can understand where that comes from, but what we're saying is the data cost, the energy required to transfer data and submit that data is the numbers we're talking about. Your eco mm -hmm. TV is the amount of energy used for an hour's worth of viewing. So okay. we are talking about two different things. We're talking about data and we're talking about end user consumption with device. So yeah, mm -hmm. if you've got a more economically advanced piece of hardware, that's more efficient at consuming that hour of television, that's gonna well, be a win. Watching. But you'd be winning if it was SD versus HD anyway. You'd be winning yeah. based on the actual quality of streaming. And, and then you've actually got to also just uh, just to jump in there, guys. Look at um, you know whether you've got solar panels on on the roof of your property that you are then you know you are carbon offsetting your your generation of energy coming through that TV as well. So there's definitely you've got your hardware in your house and, and whether you are carbon offsetting yourself and whether you've got an energy efficient uh, supplier of electricity too, and then you do then have that separate data. Uh, side of things as well and you've got to look at your supply chain so if you are um, you know relying on another company to have your cloud storage then you need to vet that supply chain to make sure that they are energy efficient and they are doing the correct things with your data and making that sustainable as well and that's a way of kind of getting around it and, and being able to rely on other companies to do that for you. 
Great. Love that. Um, Alicia's asked a really good question here. As for educating ourselves, can anyone recommend any good blogs, websites for researching more into this? Where's a go-to place we can go for information? What, what, what resources do you guys use? Uh, Who's pulling out a book? <laughs> for data center stuff, yeah, for data center stuff, like check Our out the uptime, <laughs> check out the, um, the uptime Institute. They do tons and tons of research in the data center. They're the leaders in, in data center management. Like these are the guys that, you know, understand data centers better than anyone else. Their mm -hmm. blogs, most of them, if you find anything written by a guy called Ravi Basharouche, it's mm -hmm. genuinely good. Like he's probably the smartest guy in the world when it comes to energy usage in data centers. I work closely with Ravi. He's a, he's a very smart human being. And right. anything that they put out, anything by the IEEE is good as well. Any academic journals that you want to look at by the IEEE, that's a good place. They're kind of the experts in energy efficiency. Um, they're, they're two good places to start. Great. Any other top tips, Alexis? If, if It's a bit dated, but if you have a look for um, the Carbon Trust, they, they did a, how to, it was a kind of idiot's guide for starting off and how to reduce uh, emissions um, in the tech industry and it's about 10 years old and, and it's a full youtube um webinar uh it's about uh an hour and a half long but they go through every single part of the tech that you can look at but it's bear in mind it's 10 years old but it's at the same time still applicable because it's it's how to get your computers to turn themselves off how to get your it to kind of communicate with your uh building management systems but also kind of the full spectrum of how to look at how to compact data, how to make data more uh, applicable, um, SharePoint, the various things. So it, that's a, quite a useful one to have a look at as well. Perfect. And Will, you recommended a book. Uh, yes, I did. In fact, I think it was actually like Alexis who first <laughs> mentioned this. And oh, really? Lee. Yeah, um, it's... Um, it, it, it might be where we got the stat of that seven grams of carbon per email or something like that. It's effectively a list of everyday actions from really small, low level carbon impacts to, you know, flicking on the light switch, uh, you know, turning on your, your kettle, a laptop to, to drive it one mile, all the way up to like, you know, what the carbon impact is of a war, for example, <laughs> and everything in between. So, I love yeah. that because it just brings everything to life, doesn't it? And that's what the, the irony is. It's written by Mike Berners Lee, who is Tim Berners Lee's brother. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect. Okay. So, how do we measure the impact on the environment by doing what we do? What we're doing now, video conferencing. I ask this based not against face-to-face -face meetings, but the growth and the new world that will be daily VC meetings. What is the product in terms of waste, and how can we manage? How can it be managed, measured, and reduced? Big question. Alexis, go for it. I've got, yeah, I mean, kind of going back to what Will was saying about seven grams of carbon, a, a really prime example was one email that was sent out from, um, sorry, Ben, from NHS Digital. Um, as a test email, it was sent out back in about 2016. One email just entitled test, and somebody accidentally sent it to everybody in the NHS. Bear in mind, there's 1.5 million people in the NHS. Wow. They sent it at half past eight in the morning and by quarter past nine, they had to shut the whole of the NHS email system down because it had blocked everything. Because everybody replied with, don't reply back to me, don't reply to all, don't reply to all. And it sent, I think it was in excess of mm, 20 million emails bouncing around. And the equivalent of that one little tiny email was one and a half thousand tons of carbon. That puts it in context how much of an impact something very much like a pandemic and uh, the joys of what my life is at the moment looking at face masks. When we get into looking at something that is a global impact, little, the, the how you can change stuff, that little tiny impact change that you can do for looking at how you can compact an email, having a SharePoint, it can dramatically change everything across the entire planet with basically just doing the coding in the background, changing the way you store files, the way you do SharePoints, looking at putting a link in rather than the attachment. Um, there are uh, various things for, um, Ben's kind of been instrumental in quite a lot of the assessments across uh, the UK for arms length bodies and various things. So I'll pass over to Ben because he's, he's got some more information probably. Yeah, thanks Alexis. Um, 
I've just popped a couple of links in the chat box. Um, a few comments up now they are from the bottom. Oh, cool. um, they're not from, they're not my work, but they're as good as I've seen as introductory pieces. So there's a presentation in there um, on sustainable tech and what to think about and a modeling tool for which to kind of cover the, what the original question was asking for. Um, I'm currently working on a more detailed piece of work to look at how to do net gain sustainability assessments on digital services, um, which is pretty complex. It's actually looking at implementing the government's Green Book business case guidance, which asks you to re-internalise environmental and social externalities into cost appraisals, which is a bit of a mouthful and really complicated. Um, and we're looking at doing it for digital. So watch this space. We'll, whatever we're creating will be open source. So um, we're going to do it for the greater good. Brilliant. I think um, I'm just conscious of time because people will have to go back to work, grab some lunch. So I think what we'll do is, um, I think we'll have to wrap it up there. But even like Tyler mentioned there that he that he learned something at a webinar and then deleted 25,000 emails off the back of it. So that's what today is all about, making small positive changes to lead towards bigger steps and I think that I hope that's been well covered for you what I'm going to do with the questions that we haven't had time to answer today Alicia will be on here I'm sure and um, if Alicia can do me a favor and just copy and paste them all save them in document what we'll get but what won't normally what we do is we send out um feedback form so um as part of on the feedback forms for everyone we'll try and answer the questions we'll get these experts to put some answers together for it so so all the questions will be answered for you send that out on an email i know bad i've just said about deleting all these emails but small email there's not that many of you um so you can all feed um send back a feedback form so the idea this was our first um lunchtime webinar in sustainability is that we bring together a community we've all put together some ideas to make some positive change in actions so i'm hoping that everyone's taken that away from today um, any feedback that you can provide us will be fantastic because we want to, we're looking to move this forward. Any topics that you want to cover for the future, learn more about, or if you want to get involved, please do um, send it back on the feedback form and let us know. As I mentioned, um, we host a number of events at Transition Partners, so please just follow us on LinkedIn. It's Transition Partners. Um, and I want to say a huge thank you to my group of expert panellists who have been amazing today, including your daughter, Alexis little shining star <laughs> so um yeah it was great to have everyone joining in. and thank you so much for uh, spending your lunchtime with us and um, if anyone's got any questions you can also in email info at transition partners.co.uk and we'll ask the experts to send back their response and uh, come back to you but thank you so much and thank you um guys for taking part today perfect <laughs> thank, thank you goodbye thank you bye, bye. see you